When I Should Be So Lucky hit number one on the British singles charts back in 1988, no one was more dumbfounded by her overnight success than Kylie Minogue herself. Her path to pop glory had begun by chance just one year earlier, when she and some of her neighbour's co-stars sang together at a charity benefit in Melbourne. When the audience cried out for more, Kylie suggested a sing-along to the locomotion. Her rendition of the Little Eva hit went down so well that someone suggested she should record it, and her debut single set off a chain reaction that would propel her all the way to the offices of Pete Waterman Limited in the UK. The story goes, however, that when Kylie and executive Gary Ashley flew in from Australia, hit writers Stock, Aitken and Waterman had forgotten that they were coming and hastily cobbled together a song while they waited outside. That song turned out to be I Should Be So Lucky. And by the age of 20, Kylie from Camberwell had become an accidental megastar. Her debut album spent more than a year on the British album charts, turning Kylie Minogue into a household name. Two decades later, she was a guest at her own costume exhibition at Britain's prestigious Victoria and Albert Museum, taking in the many milestones and phases of her first 20 years in show business, she couldn't help but be impressed. Oh my God! <laughs> I've been busy. And while some of the stuffy members of the British art establishment expressed outrage that the V&A had lowered itself to the glorification of pop music, Kylie, the exhibition's curator, had no trouble in justifying the retrospective. She is without a doubt an icon of uh, popular contemporary culture. And you see through the exhibition that she's somebody who's always changed her image through the 20 or so years that she's, she's, she's been in the forefront and that she's not afraid of making mistakes and that she is fantastically professional and hard-working. The exhibition stretched memories all the way back to the image that brought Kylie to fame in the mid-80s as Charlene the Mechanic in Neighbours. When her singing career took off in 1988, she ditched the overalls and left the show, along with her on- and off-screen partner Jason Donovan. The sugary pop songs, muslin dresses, curly hair and girly videos of her early pop career neatly extended the girl next door image she'd crafted on Neighbours. Her real-life romance with Jason also helped keep the spirit of Charlene alive. As well as recording the number one duet especially for you, Kylie and Jason sang together on the 1989 version of the Band-Aid single, Do They Know It's Christmas? Always friendly with the press and her fans, Smiley Kylie became a favourite on daytime children's shows. But even at the tender age of 21, she was showing signs of a serious side. Apparently Ethiopia, Ethiopia is in a worse state this year than it was last year, so everyone's getting together to help, so it's very worthwhile. Yeah. She also showed an early appreciation of the team supporting her as an artist. People forget that everyone inside the building, the TV crews, the, the you know, just everyone involved is putting in their time and, and willing to help, which is great. It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. That's my car. And mine goes. But tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. Yeah. And I'm yeah. zooming in to do my business. That appreciation of support and collaboration was to take on increasing significance as she began to test her wings. And back in 1989, she needed all the help she could get in the next stage of her metamorphosis from sugar-coated teen queen to sexy siren. Her poorly received role in the film The Delinquents may have added a little raunch to her image, but it was her next romance with sultry in excess frontman Michael Hutchins that really made the difference. Although they were rarely seen out together in public, Michael's influence on the pop princess immediately became obvious, as a more self-assured Kylie began taking control of her career. In interviews, she claimed that being with a mature man helped her strike a better balance between work and home life, 
and that she was learning to take breaks. Michael, who was quoted as saying that his favorite hobby was corrupting Kylie, was also credited with helping her construct a more glamorous, sexy image. In return, Kylie became something of a muse for Michael, who wrote the song Suicide Blonde about her. Kylie's growing confidence brought her to another major stage in her evolution towards the end of 1991, when she bravely decided not to renew her contract with PWL. I don't think you're meant to, to leave that kind of hit factory and I don't think anyone else did, so it, yeah, it was hard. Once again, she acknowledged she couldn't have done it alone. I, I put a lot of it down to luck um, and the fact that the public were, were very, um, well, yeah, as open as possible to me changing and doing different things. And I, I will be eternally thankful for that because any number of people who w were doing the same as I was doing back then, who knows what they're capable of and who knew what I was capable of. And yet I was given the chance. And yet again, the twist in direction went hand in hand with upheaval in her private life. As she embarked on her new career with Deconstruction Records, Michael embarked on an affair with model Helena Christensen. But he and Kylie were to remain friends until his tragic suicide death in 1997. In the intervening years, Kylie's self-titled album had been released to mixed reviews, but it signaled her determination to take more control over her music and exploit her sexuality. The video to Confide in Me featured her engaging in phone sex while she performed a slow strip tease in the Barbarella-inspired Put Yourself in My Place. By the time Michael Hutchins died, Kylie was in a relationship with French photographer Stéphane Sednaoui, who was encouraging her to play down the glamour and bring out her inner rock chick. The result was her 1998 album Impossible Princess. Once again, the press fixated on her change of image. I think people think we sit around at a big board meeting and say, right, we're going to completely change you this time, what will we do? And it's, it's not like that. For Kylie, the constant evolution was just a natural part of growing up. You know, if they have a snapshot of me in their mind from, be it 10 years ago or three years ago, um, I'm bound to change. By now, London had become home. For the last 10 years, basically, been living here, so my life revolves around this city now, and my friends and the people that I regard as family. Which made it almost a decade since she'd said goodbye to Charlene and neighbours. There's still that, that cringe factor for sure, but I'm far more accepting of, of that time, yeah. I mean, I look at, if I see pictures of me from then, it's kind of like looking at a different girl, I think, my like, God. Madame Tussauds Wax Museum agreed and decided it was also time for them to update their image of the pop princess. The original figure, which had been commissioned way back in 1989, was looking hopelessly out of date, so they asked her to sit for another, and Kylie was delighted with the result. I think she looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they, they did a really good job. For the queen of reinvention, the update had been long overdue. It's, it's a lot easier standing next to her than it was with the old waxwork. Um, and I guess between 20 and 30, your face changes a lot. And, um, so, yeah, it's a lot easier standing next to her. With luminous skin, flawless makeup and immaculate poise, it was hard to tell the real Kylie apart from her new wax effigy, which represented the next phase in her evolving career, and which was still getting the thumbs up from her loyal fans. She's just brilliant. All her records are brilliant. She's brilliant. She's so nice. The songs are catchy and they're nice to dance to. I just think she's beautiful. She's improving every day. Like She's not getting worse, that's for sure. <laughs> she's getting better every day. At 30 years old, the pop princess was finally breaking free from the restrictions that had governed her earlier output. I look back at when I started, which was very controlled, but 
it worked at the time. And, and if they had said to me, look, you tell us what you want for your next album, it wouldn't have worked. In retrospect, they were, um, you know, didn't do much for my confidence at the time, but it worked. I, I can't deny that. And they were very <laughs> clever. Six years after leaving Stock Aitken and Waterman, Kylie from Camberwell was giving herself permission to experiment with different styles and develop her songwriting. I was literally writing anything I felt on any given day and um, then it would become a song. And just um, trying to find an honesty with that and, and not have to be what I've been before or what people would perceive me as being or even what what I knew. Going out on a limb and abandoning herself to the creative process took her into uncharted territory. Um, I've found that I've done a lot on this album that is surprising to myself even. I mean, I hear things back and think, God, I never thought that I would sound like that or that I would be capable of writing that song. She wasn't the only one who was surprised by her new sound. Billboard magazine called the album stunning. However, UK's Music Week declared that Kylie's vocals had taken on a stroppy edge, but were not strong enough to do much. Impossible Princess became the lowest selling album of her career, and she was forced to reevaluate her strengths. I learned a bit of a lesson in the last couple of years about what I do best. I started out doing pop and I think that's what I'm definitely what I'm gonna do next. Her no holds barred exercise in pushing the boundaries had taught her that even she had her limits. I think she's uh, moved on from the like the soap star image, but it'll always be there to haunt her. Having accepted that she could take the girl out of neighbours but would never fully escape Charlene, she wasted no time in bouncing back. In April 1999, she signed a new deal with Parlophone Records, and by the year 2000, her nod to 70s disco was soaring up the charts. Light Years went on to sell two million copies worldwide, and New Musical Express wrote, Kylie's capacity for reinvention is staggering, and declared the album sheer joy. Its debut single, Spinning Around, delivered her first number one single in the UK for 10 years. The pop princess was back, bigger than ever, and to prove it, she sang one of the album's singles on a night like this to an audience of 2.1 billion viewers at the closing ceremony of the Sydney Olympics. Despite the enormity of the occasion, she didn't let nerves get the better of her. I don't think I'll ever do anything bigger than the Olympics. That doesn't cross my mind once you're doing it. You just try and get it right for the people who were there. Meanwhile, she'd started up a new relationship with model James Gooding, who was seven years her junior. The latest incarnation of Kylie was all about sex and sophistication, and it was working like a charm. Her 2001 album, Fever, mixed the disco feel of light years with the sounds of 80s electro pop. I feel with this album, it, it's the most cohesive project I've done, musically, visually, um, my, the amount of Kylie, I suppose, that's in it. Um, it, it just all seemed to work. It was really easy to record. Barely had the album been finished, then she was thinking about her next move. I, I have had a, a growing desire in the past couple of years to get back into acting. I think I must have recovered from the really bad movies that I did enough to think, hmm, OK, I think I can go in and do something that, that, uh, that I can be proud of. However, she had to put thoughts of a return to acting on hold when, after 14 years of knocking on America's door, she was finally welcomed with open arms on the back of the lead single, Can't Get You Out of My Head which reached number one on the dance club charts. She was swamped at record store signings on her promotional tour and displayed the same approachability and friendliness towards the fans and press that had characterized her public appearances from the start. And she'd lost none of her girl next door humility. For many years, I've just thought, well, the States is a, a place I'm not going to work. I'll just come for vacations, and I was quite content with that. 
but I did always give myself a, uh, a kind of an escape clause. And I said that if I, if, you know, by miracle, if I ever had a song that started to take off, then I would come and follow it up. At the age of 34, when most pop stars are thinking about retiring, Kylie was just hitting her stride, and Madame Tussauds was busily moulding another waxwork in an attempt to keep up. But this time, the museum's interpretation of Kylie's current incarnation didn't quite match her own. Apparently, Kylie had agreed to let the museum create the model from a photo in which she'd posed on all fours. However, the photo had been taken from the front, which had gone some way towards preserving her modesty. When she saw the picture of the side-on waxwork wearing the micro-mini and thigh-high boots in a daily paper, she was instantly dismayed. But by then, it was too late. Still, her guest appearance in the West End in the play What I Wrote about British comedians Morecambe and Wise would have been a timely distraction, and her performance as a fat, balding, dancing monk could not have put more distance between her and her practically pornographic waxwork. Well used to the adoration of fawning fans, she came over all bashful when fielding compliments after the show from Prince Charles. Uh, I, well, with these guys, something like that, yeah. <laughs> Scooping more awards than ever before, not only was she being recognised by the usual roll call of mainstream pop honours, like the Brit Awards and Smash Hits, she was also earning accolades from the more serious music journalists over at NME, who'd previously dismissed Kylie as a pop lightweight. For readers of NME to, to have um, taken note of what I'm doing and, and to, to like it and to bother to vote is, is amazing. But no matter how many goals she was kicking with her career, reporters were still obsessed with her private life and the question of whether she would ever get married. Get married? I, w I was asked, you know, do you, so do you think you'll ever get married? And I said, I'm so exasperated with the question. I, I said, um, yeah, meaning yes, one day there is a possibility. The possibility of an imminent trip down the aisle evaporated when James was caught having an affair with fellow model Sophie Dahl and admitted in the press that he cheated on Kylie on numerous occasions. In an interview with a Sunday tabloid, he accused the pop princess of being a self-obsessed control freak who would end up a lonely spinster. Kylie later admitted that she felt betrayed by her ex, whose violent mood swings and drug taking, not to mention his infidelity, had forced her to leave him. While James was doing his dirty laundry in the press, Kylie was airing her new underwear at the London launch of her Love Kylie range, proving that there had perhaps been some merit to her ex's claim that she was a bit of a control freak. Hallproof, which is a manufacturing company in Australia, asked me if I would like to be the face of another one of their ranges. And uh, I said, well, no, frankly, but I would like my own range, which stems from just a genuine love of lingerie. Her skimpy briefs and sexy bras sold like hotcakes across Australia and the UK and cemented Kylie's knack for tapping into trends and staying in touch with the tastes of the public. Of course, however, she wasn't about to take all the credit for that herself. We, uh, we definitely are eager to get feedback, so I'm always hassling my friends. I'll happily give you lots of lingerie, but the deal is you have to tell me honestly what you think, what fits, what doesn't fit, what, what you would like to see in the range. As Kylie has always acknowledged, the job of keeping her at the top of her game has been a hugely collaborative effort. Unlike many of her more fickle peers, she has stuck with the same manager Terry Blamey since the start of her singing career back in 1987. Her accountant father Ron is her financial advisor. Her mother Carol helps with quick changes when she's on tour. And her stylist William Baker has been the genius behind her reinvention since 1994. Kylie has been quoted as saying, I try to work with the best people I can and take from them what I can. Hopefully I enhance what they do as well. 
In 2001, she successfully enhanced the pair of gold hot pants that William had found in a London flea market for 50p in the video for Spinning Around. Two years later, he helped her craft the Bridget Bardot-inspired look that launched her ninth studio album, Body Language. <laughs> now in her mid-30s, she was trading in the sizzling sex kitten image for a more mature, sultry one, a change that was also reflected in her music. But I think it's, it's indicative of, of pop music today. You can't really separate your image from your music, so... I think it works. I think it just reflects me being a 35-year-old woman. The, the, the tempo's down. There's been a few people that, that hear the album and go, OK, so where's the big, you know, n -s -n -s -n club songs? And there really isn't any of those, but you can move to them. The album was launched with a one-off invitation-only gig at Hammersmith Odeon. And at a press conference, she spoke about the people who had influenced her growing up. Olivia Newton-John is the first one that comes to mind when I was nine years old and um, wanted to be in those skin-tight black leggings and top and all of that. Uh, Madonna, moving on a little bit, probably to when I was 14. And in a frank interview to promote the album, she tackled the topic of her overtly sexual image. Part of what I've grown up with the icons of mine when I w was younger were glamorous, sexy women. And I really, uh, I, I don't think of myself that way. I go home and stilettos come off and slippers go on and I'm really not very <laughs> glamorous at all. So it's, it's like role play and it's something that I, I'm certainly not ashamed of. I try and have fun with it. She jumped at the chance to defend herself from the constant criticism that her provocative image was a thinly veiled attempt to distract people from her lack of talent. There's a lot of playfulness and there's a lot of history and, um, and, and a lot of serious work that goes into what I do. My job is to make it look easy for you, to make it look like, oh, I'm just luxuriating being a woman. I'm not. I work really, really I love hard work. I mean, that's, that's something that I've done for a long, long time. And, yeah, a part of who I am is, is a sensual person. She did admit, however, that her approach to performing had changed over the years. I, I think when I was younger, my voice was, was the last thing I considered, and now it's the first thing. The choreography, the special effects, love it, love you all, great. But, guys, I've got to sing, so let's make that the priority. Everything's changed for me. The way that I would, I, I would perform older songs and perform them differently now. It's inevitable, I think. It's inevitable, and on top of that, I, I've tried my hardest to, to better myself and to do my job as well as I can. The magazine All Music described body language as what happens when a dance pop diva takes the high road and focuses on what's important instead of trying to shock herself into continued relevance. While the album didn't go on to repeat the sales success of Fever, it marked yet another successful transformation for the constantly evolving pop princess. The release of her greatest hits package, Ultimate Kylie, the following year took her tally of top 10 singles up to 29 and made her the second most successful woman on the British charts behind fellow chameleon Madonna. As commentators try to make sense of Kylie's continued success, some put it down to her unique ability to combine the seemingly opposing characteristics of the seductive temptress and the girl next door. Through all her years of raunch and sauciness, Smiley Kylie had miraculously held on to her wholesome appeal and preserved her family-friendly status, her honesty in interviews, down-to-earth sense of humor and continued approachability harked back to Charlene in the minds of her fans. She's just like um, the girl next door. She's like your best friend. She's wonderful. On her ITV special, An Audience with Kylie Minogue, she welcomed the star-studded audience as if she were hosting a children's show, then proceeded to invite the gathered guests to probe her with personal questions. 
When asked how she dealt with all the media attention, she advised them to cry when you need to, laugh as much as possible, and try and remember what's fact and what's fiction. Since the start of her career, she'd become used to waking up to reports that she'd suffered a nervous breakdown or that she'd just become engaged. Most recently, the media had been having a field day with a rumor that she'd fallen pregnant to her French boyfriend, Olivier Martinez. In fact, wide-of-the-mark reports surrounding Kylie's private life had become so commonplace that when the news broke that she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2005, it was met with skepticism. Nobody was willing to believe that little Kylie had been struck down by such a life-threatening disease at just 37 years of age. As the news sank in, it stunned her peers and fans alike, especially at home in Australia. Shock and devastation. I'm, 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 you know, ideally love her and I have great respect. I guess I was shocked because we don't think that people like Kylie Minogue, this big sensation, is going to be, um, you know, open to a disease. I, I think it's kind of ridiculous that we have this attitude um, because, of course, cancer can target any person. It doesn't matter how famous you are or how intelligent or how good looking. It doesn't matter. It's indiscriminative. So um, it was a bit of a shock, but then in that sense, she's a human being. So it doesn't really matter. Messages of support flooded in, and even Australia's Prime Minister, John Howard, was prompted to comment. Well, I think everybody feels shocked and saddened. Uh, a young woman, Kylie Minogue, any young woman of that age, uh, to be diagnosed with that condition, uh, it does uh, send a shudder through you. She's, you know, an Australian icon and she represents Australia all over the world, so I'm sure that she's a bit of, you know, one of Australia's golden girls, so I think everybody would be wishing her well. One person who understood exactly what she was going through was her childhood icon, Olivia Newton-John, who'd been through her own battle with breast cancer and urged the press and public to give Kylie the time and space she needed to recover in private. As Kylie retreated to her parents' home in Melbourne, her sister Danny flew home to be by her side, and the job of keeping the world posted was left to her spokesman and former record company boss, Michael Gadinsky. I'm not privy to be discussing those details, but uh, she'll go into treatment immediately, and uh, obviously there'll be more news in a short period of time, but um, our thoughts and everyone's thoughts are with her, and uh, like I said, she's a pretty fit girl, and a strong girl and uh, hopefully uh, it is pretty early and uh, hopefully with uh, the great doctors there are today that uh, she'll be out there strutting her stuff before too long. She was forced to cancel the Australian leg of her showgirl tour and underwent surgery to remove the tumour later in May. She then headed to Paris for further treatment. After undergoing chemotherapy, Photos of her sporting headscarves and a cropped hairdo made the rounds in various news bulletins and gossip magazines. Some of the photos were taken by Olivier, who was rumoured to have asked her to marry him. The same rumours claimed that Kylie had turned him down, fearing that his proposal may have been prompted by sympathy. This would have been too much to take for a woman who refused to feel sorry for herself. In October, she sent a message of support to cancer sufferers at a charity ball in London. Her sister, Danny, read out the message, which bore the words, I'm currently a cancer patient. I aim to be a cancer survivor. This is only possible with the incredible work done by so many within the field, doctors, specialists, scientists, and volunteers. The message also sent solidarity to those whose lives have been affected by breast cancer and gave thanks to those who are helping in each and every way. Even while undergoing treatment, she was determined not to pass up on the opportunity to use her profile to promote awareness of cancer. It won her great admiration from breast cancer campaigners. Being breast aware, which is the message that she's giving out, is really important. You know, 41,000 women are diagnosed with this disease every year in the UK. Um, so being breast aware and recognising the signs and symptoms of breast cancer is really important. Proving that she was still very much looking to the future, she also found the energy to write her first children's book, The Showgirl Princess, and to begin work on the launch of her first perfume, in collaboration with Coty. 
In early 2006, reports began to emerge of her improving health. And in June, she appeared on stage unannounced at one of her sister Danny's concerts, to the hysterical delight of fans, one of whom managed to record the moment on his mobile phone camera. Absolutely shocked. Everybody was just like, oh my God, it's Kylie. The grainy footage wouldn't have won any awards for cinematography, but it was proof positive that the pop princess had taken her first steps towards a fairy tale comeback. The next month, she showed off her chic short hairdo as she worked her way to the front of a Chanel show in Paris. Two months later, she was doing it for the kids at a packed out London bookstore. Looking radiant, she was overjoyed to have finally fulfilled her father Ron's prophecy. My dad will love this. <laughs> He's always said, one day you're going to write children's book. I know that sounds impossible, but that's, I, I remember that from being a child. The aim behind writing The Showgirl Princess was to give young girls an insight into her life and to instill them with the importance of self-belief and the value of friendship and teamwork. For those who queued for hours to meet her, she'd already become a huge role model. I think it's really amazing like how strong she is and like, she's looking as gorgeous as ever. I think she's really strong to actually come back and face our fans again. She's a good singer and I just kind of I like her music and she's nice. And for the showgirl princess herself, it was a major milestone in an extraordinary life she would never take for granted again. I think everything I'm doing at the moment feels slightly monumental because I'm here and it's happening, so... However, it seemed as though she still hadn't learned to stop and smell the roses. Despite rumours that even her bosom buddy William Baker had advised her to retire and take time out, the Kylie juggernaut was firing on all cylinders. First up, she was hitting the catwalk at the Dolce & Gabbana fashion show. After that, she revealed that her favourite designers had been hard at work, coming up with more costumes ahead of the resumption of her interrupted showgirl tour. And Kylie was ready to roll. I'm thrilled to be here and to be with guys that I know and love and to be to be creative again, to be inspired and uh, and dazzled by everything on that run. So be careful if she's back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> attenzione, attenzione. With her DNG costumes packed, she headed to Sydney. But instead of saving all her energy for her forthcoming stage shows, she cheekily squeezed in the launch of her perfume, Darling. Oh, it was so much fun to work on something that wasn't music, that, that was its own. We all worked really hard to create something that didn't look like an album cover, um, mm. that had its own, uh, its own sense, its own, um, its own space. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun. Then it was down to the business of getting back on stage for her first concert since her illness. Ahead of the gig at the Sydney Entertainment Centre, her loyal fans were proving the depth of their devotion. Very excited to see Kylie. Fanatical fan. Yes. Crazy. So I actually yeah, went okay. to the last show in London that she did, and now I'm going to the first show after her illness, so it's quite exciting. Performing on a huge Art Deco set with 13 dancers and a truckload of feathers shipped in from the Lido Theatre in Paris, as well as a $10 million laser show, she'd had to adapt her original routines to allow for a less taxing performance and slower costume changes. Highly emotional, she shed a few tears before dedicating Especially For You to her father. The sellout extravaganza was declared nothing less than a triumph by the Sydney Morning Herald. And the fans were beside themselves. It was amazing. She's so beautiful. Kylie's my princess. Everything was better, and the costumes were better, and she was better, and I loved it. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Awesome! <laughs>
was also aus. Ich schaue das 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 aus. The second night she upped the ante by treating fans to a special guest appearance by Bono, who was in town with you too. With Kylie prowling the stage in a Lycra leopard costume, footage of their duet of kids made it onto newsreels around the world. While her trademark flamboyant glamour and confident sexual posturing had sealed her as a camp favourite since the early days, her emotional and dramatic comeback in late 2006 made her truly deserving of the gay icon status she'd achieved. Although she'd once disputed the label, claiming there'd been no tragedy in her life, only tragic outfits, her triumph over adversity had put her on a par with classic tragic heroines like Marilyn Monroe and Judy Garland. The singer herself dates her evolution as a gay icon back to 1989, when the news media began their assault on her. Kylie believes that gay fans responded to her obvious distress and adopted the five-foot singer as their mascot. She, in turn, has remained deeply loyal to them, performing at gay venues and events and openly supporting AIDS charities and gay rights causes. As well as surrounding herself with overtly gay creatives like William Baker, Dolce & Gabbana and Jean-Paul Gaultier, She's rewarded her gay male fans with plenty of homoerotic content in her live shows and video clips, which often feature scantily clad, sculpted male dancers, sporting makeup and high heels. A few months after returning to the stage, Kylie's 20-year love affair with High Camp was being celebrated at one of Britain's most highbrow art venues. Coming together in all their glory at the Victoria and Albert Museum were the Voodoo Inferno dress, the leopard print cat suit, the pink Galliano corset and the muslin cotton dress from I Should Be So Lucky and some rather oily reminders of her time on Neighbours. The exhibition goes right back. In fact, we have the, the overalls from Charlene and Neighbours. Um, but it starts, I suppose, in 1987 with I Should Be So Lucky and the Jenny Bannister muslin dress. And it takes a look at her changing image through videos and also in performances. Uh, but I suppose the, the part of the exhibition that, were, were, that is most up to date is the tour section. And that's where Kylie says herself her creativity really comes to the fore. The exhibition also included the famous white hooded jumpsuit that Kylie barely wore in the video to Can't Get You Out of My Head. There's a great story that when Kylie saw it and saw how it was cut, she wondered how on earth she was going to wear it. And I'm sure there must have been some tape involved in that. When Kylie rocked up to the exhibition launch on the arm of Michael Baker, she was regaled with questions about her recent split from Olivier Martinez, following rumours that he'd had an affair with actress Salma Hayek. As ever, she responded to the personal questions with the grace and discretion befitting her pop royalty status. I'm just going to say that I'm here tonight and having a wonderful time, thinking about my friend also, and uh, he's wished me all the best for tonight, so, yeah, it's all, it's all good. With Kylie's consistently polite refusals to talk about her private life, the public would have to make do with a privileged glimpse inside her wardrobe. So I hope that everyone who comes to see it will um, enjoy getting a little bit up close and personal. There was one item in particular the visitors wanted to get to know. People are really interested in the gold hot pants. Because in, in 2000 Kylie relaunched her career with Spinning Around and became incredibly successful and popular again. And, those gold hot pants have a real sense of sort of mystery about them too, because we don't know who designed them. They were bought very cheaply from a flea market. Kylie, the exhibition, even recreated the dressing room from Kylie's most recent concert at Wembley Stadium. Seeing the fruits of her labours all in one place was a tiny reminder of how much she'd already achieved. 
and the little lady with a big wardrobe wasn't about to sit around taking it easy. Kylie's mass appeal and iconic sense of style made her an obvious target for fashion label H&M, which has become famous for its recent collaborations with big-name artists like Madonna. The Swedish retailer asked her to put her name to a beachwear line, and she ended up performing at the launch of their store in mainland China. I wouldn't um, call myself a fashion designer, but they've taken uh, influence from my style, whatever that is. <laughs> And I love the, the capsule range they've created. It's definitely what I would wear at the beach, off the beach, with the summer theme. Then it was over to the south of France to help raise money for AIDS sufferers at Sharon Stone's annual Amphar benefit at Cannes. She performed a jazzed-up version of the locomotion while getting audience members to part with cash. Ten grand? Anyone on this table? And then she and Sharon teamed up for the benefits finale to treat the audience to a duet of Can't Get You Out of My Head. If she was upset about her split from Olivier after four years, she certainly wasn't letting it show. But then Kylie has never been one to play the bleeding heart. However, during a press conference in Berlin later in the year, she opened up a little on the subject of settling down and starting a family. I'm asked a lot about that at the moment, and uh, I can only say very generally that a family in the future would be wonderful. Um, I don't think it's something that I can necessarily plan, <laughs> but if that were to happen, you know, that would, my life would go on a brand new uh, path and I think it would be fantastic. For the time being, she was content with reflecting upon how important her own family had been throughout her ordeal with cancer. I think, I felt at times during that time that it was possibly harder for my family than it was for me. Um, that feeling of helplessness, but their strength was really so incredible and admirable, and um, I learned a lot more about my family and, and friends, you know, people who are close. At an awards due later that year, Danny was just happy to have her big sister back. It's been a long ordeal and one that I'm glad that's over. I just really want to look to the future and, and good, exciting times. She was there to present Kylie with the first Music Industry Trusts Award ever to go to a woman in its 16-year history. Surrounded by a long list of luminaries with whom she collaborated over her career, including Jake Shears from Scissor Sisters and 80s singer Kathy Dennis, who produced Fever, Clearly, she was out to have a good time. This is just such an enormous honour, and I, I really thank you from... I won't say the heart of my bottom. From the bottom of... <laughs> <laughs> from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. I hope you've had a great night. <laughs> there were more accolades to come. At the Q Magazine Awards in October, she was coming to terms with being named Q Idol of the Year. I still haven't prepared what to say. I'll, I'll probably make it up. Well, I'll have to make it up once I'm there. I mean, what do you say to that? It's great. I'm really pleased. As she went in to prepare her speech, many of her younger peers were piling on the praise. I think she is oh, an look, icon. Kylie, she's yeah. a strong woman. She's been through so much and come out the other end, you know, as strong as ever. She's looking amazing and, you know, I just think she's a great woman and yeah. someone to look up to. It's nice to see her back. Yeah. She's made some brilliant songs, great music, fantastic imagery, and she's shown an incredible amount of strength, obviously, in the last couple of years, too. All the great publicity augured well for the release of White Diamond, the documentary made by William Baker about the lead-up to her stage comeback. With barely any breathing space in between, she was back in front of the cameras promoting the release of her 10th studio album, X. She'd started work on the album in May 2006, as she began her slow recovery from breast cancer. Looking back, it was incredible to think that it had only been 12 short months since making that tentative comeback in Sydney.
2007 also brought up another momentous event, the unveiling of an unprecedented fourth waxwork at Madame Tussauds. Only the Queen has had more figures than Kylie. She's had five, but Kylie Minogue's pop royalty. She's a, a pop chameleon. She's so popular because she changes images and moods at the time. So our fans here and our guests have wanted exactly the same. They wanted to see a new up-to-date Kylie, so it made sense. Mark IV Kylie, dressed in a costume from her showgirl tour, was a little more sedate than her earlier wax models and reflected the maturing image of the 39-year-old pop princess whose connections with real-life royalty were set to deepen. In July 2008, two months after her 40th birthday, she was in a limousine on her way to Buckingham Palace to collect an order of the British Empire for her lifetime contribution to pop music. Presenting her with the OBE would be Prince Charles, who had been so impressed with her all-singing, all-dancing turn as a bald monk in the West End four years earlier. While on tour in Paris, she'd been summoned by the French cultural minister to be honoured as Chevalier of the Order of Arts and Letters. It was a very proud moment for Carol and Ron, as they watched their eldest daughter accept the medal previously awarded to the likes of Bob Dylan, Meryl Streep and Bono. Having spent so much time living in France with Olivier, she picked up enough of the language to express her gratitude in French. C'est un moment exceptionnel pour moi d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui à Paris. Merci beaucoup et merci. To have her incredible achievements formally recognized by her adopted countries was fitting reward for 20 years of continual reinvention and tireless dedication to honing her craft as well as entertaining audiences. However, Kylie would no doubt have been just as humbled to receive the Excellence in Entertainment Award at the annual Gadea LA Australia Week, presented by her number one icon and fellow cancer survivor. Kylie, who's being honoured tonight, um, has done so much for pop music. Without being Aussie, she's just done a lot for pop music. And she's beautiful and she's creative and she's been through a lot with dignity and grace and she's an international star. I think it's wonderful. Well, to, to be considered an Australian who's doing well and representing... Well, who they're pleased to have representing Australia around the world. It's amazing. It was a great opportunity to take in just how much she'd achieved over the past two decades. Apart from racking up record sales of more than 60 million and staging 10 elaborate tours, she'd won countless music and style awards, founded a successful lingerie company, written a children's book, acted in films, received both an OBE and a French Legion of Honor, survived cancer and become a role model for thousands of young fans around the world. But despite her incredible achievements, it seems there is never any escape from the recurring questions about the romantic future of a pop princess who, at the age of 40, still doesn't seem to have found her prince charming. Uh, I'm a fatalist and I've been lucky enough to, to have some great relationships. I have always believed they run the time they're meant to run, so we'll see what's around the corner for me. After recent newspaper reports that she has since found love in the arms of 30-year-old Spanish supermodel Andre Valencozo, it looks as though Kylie may finally have found her man. But like all of her former beaux, he'll need to be prepared to fit in around her unyieldingly punishing schedule. At the 2008 unveiling of a new home furnishings line, which she co-designed with William Baker, she offered up a revealing insight into what living with Kylie Minogue might be like. I'm always ripping pages out of magazines, underlining passages in books, and just, just random, really random stuff. Um, and I find that more and more so these days, I'm just, I'm really, really hungry for, for that kind of creative stimulation. Um, I mean, now we're, we're preparing to go back on the road and a whole new tour means a whole new concept and outfits and everything. So my mind is literally, you can probably hear me as I'm sleeping. As she ramps up for her latest tour to celebrate the album X, the go-go girl inside Kylie Minogue is showing absolutely no signs of letting up and settling down. 
I'm absolutely happiest when I'm busy. But surrounded by her treasured friends and collaborators, there is no way she will ever be left feeling lonely. I really consider myself fortunate to ha have a, a job where there's so many creative elements and outlets and I work with great teams and I think the standard that I want or inspire is, is, is around and that's, you know, I couldn't do it without these wonderful people.